The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Beloved saints of God, grace to you and peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The closest I have ever been to the body of Christ was at the place where that body died. Calvary, the site of Jesus' crucifixion. In Jesus' day, Calvary was a rocky hill just outside the city gates of Jerusalem where criminals were put to death. Today, it's buried underneath an enormous, ornate church in the old city. When you visit Calvary, you wait inside this church for hours alongside hundreds of other religious pilgrims from all over the world. One by one, you kneel beneath this lavish gold altar that has been constructed on the spot. You have to get down on your hands and knees and actually crawl underneath it. And then you can reach down into a hole in the floor under the altar. And at the bottom of the hole, you can touch stone, the ground that was beneath the cross of Christ. You have traveled for days 
and waited for hours, but your chance to touch this particular stone lasts only a few seconds. And if you're like me, you spend those few seconds trying to imagine that this very stone that you are touching with your body was once touched by the body of Jesus. You try to feel some kind of physical closeness to Christ, to reach underneath everything that humans have piled on over the years, and you think maybe Jesus was here, right here. Maybe his feet, his hands, his blood touched this very rock. Maybe this is the closest I'll ever be to the real body of Christ. And then your turn is over, you get up and move on, so another pilgrim can reach the very ground touched by God. While I was away visiting the place where Jesus died, back home in Chicago, my seminary advisor died. Gordon was my wise teacher and trusted friend, an encourager and confidant in my journey as a ministerial leader. His death was unexpected, and it was jarring to receive this news on the other side of the world. The last time we had spoken, neither of us knew he was sick, so we hadn't said goodbye. For months after, it felt surreal that he was really gone, and I struggled to say out loud that he had died. But this morning, almost exactly 10 months since his passing, I am ready to hear it out loud. I added Gordon's name to the Book of Saints so he can be lifted up in prayer alongside all the precious ones that we remember today. There are countless stories about who these saints were and the impact they had on your lives. There are countless memories of joy and sorrow that fill this room as their names are read. We speak their names because there is power in naming. There is power in remembering. When we remember the saints who have gone before us, it is because their faithfulness inspires us to live faithfully. The way that they embodied Christ to us moves us to embody Christ in the world now. We call these departed siblings in faith saints, not because their lives were flawless, but because their lives were beloved. They were and are loved by you, and they were and are infinitely loved by God. Sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that one has to earn the designation of saint by living a perfect life of selfless service. But in our tradition, we name all the faithful as saints, knowing that all are imperfect and all are forgiven. Certainly, we should do our very best to embody God's compassion in our actions. Jesus tells us more than once that we are called to care for any who are in need and to love even our enemies. But it is not human actions that make saints. It is God's action. God's boundless love, God's unlimited mercy, that's what makes saints of us all. Each life, marked by both weeping and laughter, is seen and valued by God. Each person, simultaneously saint and sinner, is held in God's grace. No life is too broken, too painful, too sinful for God to be fully present. Everyone, no matter their circumstances, can be transformed by the Spirit for the sake of the gospel. Jesus' words in Luke are a reminder of this. Jesus says that those who suffer will be the inheritors of the riches of God's kingdom. Those who are poor, hungry, and excluded are called blessed in God's reign. 
Blessing, then, doesn't always entail feeling good or avoiding struggle. Blessing doesn't equate to worldly success. If you measure the value of a life by what the world considers successful, you will miss the ways that God's Spirit is at work in all people, regardless of how successful they look according to the world's standards. When we name and remember the saints who have gone before, we don't remember their worldly success, we remember their faithfulness to God. Likewise, when we name and celebrate the saints who are newly baptized, we don't claim for them the gift of wealth or comfort, but the gift of God's spirit and the call to God's mission. The true blessing that is given to all the saints is the gracious love of God, abundant in this life and the next, an inheritance that is sure, a treasure that is eternal. It cannot be undone or taken away, not by hunger, not by poverty, not by suffering, not by death. Thanks be to God. And because that inheritance is sure and that treasure is eternal, you are freed. You are freed by love of God and you are freed to love of neighbor. You are sent out to proclaim the gospel, the good news with your words and with your deeds. And the good news is this, Christ has died Christ is risen, Christ will come again. No! Resurrection is the good news. God makes life possible where life seemed impossible. And that means that Christ's death on Calvary was not the final word. So the place where Jesus died was not the closest I've ever been to Christ's body because Christ's body is not there on that rock at Calvary, because Christ's body is not dead. God's resurrecting power is stronger than death and has redeemed all of creation. And Paul tells us that the very same power that raised Christ from the dead is still at work in the world, in you. You are the living body of Christ. You, the saints of God, the ones marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit, the ones sent out into the world to serve, you are Christ's body. The body of Christ is here, right here, alive among the faithful saints of God. Saints that have passed into eternal life, saints that are living out the mission of the gospel right now, and saints who are being baptized into new life every day. The church, full of beloved saints, is the body of Christ being made new again and again. That is the power of resurrection, and that is the power of God in you. Amen. <laughs>